good afternoon good evening and good morning uh, to everyone uh, joining us uh, from uh, different locations from within the country and even outside the country on behalf of the op jindal uh, global university uh, i have great pleasure in welcoming all the uh, distinguished panelists to this very important panel on breaking the barriers of public versus uh, private in indian universities uh, within the context of uh, the national education policy uh, which uh, we have convened as part of our world university summit uh, 2023 in consonance with the g20 objectives and the developments that are taking place uh, around us uh, socially and uh, geopolitically and to sort of uh, assess and evaluate as to what uh, universities from india and around the world can contribute to these discussions in order to make a significant impact on the common good of uh, education. So for this particular session, uh, which we are going to discuss on the barriers uh, between the public uh, uh, universities and the private universities, uh, we do have uh, an interesting panel of uh, education uh, leaders uh, representing uh, some of the uh, prominent universities uh, from India, and uh, we are going to discuss on uh, the issues pertaining to the gaps uh, that had occurred uh, between uh, public universities and uh, private universities and the governance of those gaps in order to meaningfully uh, contribute uh, to uh, education, as I just men uh, mentioned a few seconds ago. And uh, to set the theme or uh, the context uh, for discussion, as uh, all of you are aware, uh, whosoever uh, has joined uh, this panel uh, at this particular moment, uh, number one, uh, this uh, particular uh, panel and the conference uh, is happening uh, at a time when uh, there is uh, so much of discussion uh, going on uh, achieving uh, the sustainable development goals. Uh, all the 17 goals which are intricately connected to one another and in particular to focus on uh, the aspect of uh, inclusive and uh, equitable quality education uh, which is one of the prominent goals or the goal four uh, of the uh, sustainable development goals so therefore uh, every institution within the country and outside the country uh, they do have a responsibility uh, to ensure uh, inclusive and uh, equitable uh, quality education and to therefore even promote uh, lifelong learning opportunities for all uh, by the time period that's been already set. So therefore, while uh, these are some very important goals and ambitions, uh, these cannot be uh, achieved without the apparatus of education and uh, educational uh, institutions. And uh, this particular aspect uh, has also been uh, outlined uh, in the National uh, Education Policy uh, 2020, uh, wherein uh, one of the objectives uh, of uh, the uh, National Education Policy 2020 is for India uh, to have an education system, uh, which is uh, rather, you know, the best or uh, second to none, uh, with equitable access to highest quality education for all learners. Uh, regardless of their economic background or uh, even the uh, social background. And uh, in addition to uh, this particular goal, or rather even to ensure that uh, this goal uh, is uh, achieved uh, in order to contribute to all the 10 indicators prominently mentioned uh, in the uh, NEP, uh, it is incumbent upon the higher educational institutions that by the year 2040, uh, that they should not only become uh, multidisciplinary institutions, uh, but they shall even aim to have larger students' enrollments, uh, preferably in the thousands, as outlined in the uh, NEP, while making optimal use of uh, the infrastructure or the resources. And all the universities or the higher educational institutions uh, will have to work uh, achieving uh, towards these goals uh, because uh, uh, the goals uh, outlined in the NEP or the objectives uh, they also uh, sort of uh, rather uh, uh, make it important for the uh, universities to cater uh, to the larger needs of the uh, society at large, uh, wherein we have uh, 
great number of aspirants uh, going in for higher education, uh, but at the same time, uh, the number of uh, educational institutions uh, are not either adequate enough or uh, there are not uh, many uh, educational institutions uh, offering uh, good quality uh, education. So therefore, uh, while uh, the national education policy uh, focuses on growth of both public and private institutions, but nonetheless, again, there is a dichotomy uh, wherein the NEP uh, again has a particular uh, sort of emphasis on uh, developing uh, quote unquote, uh, large number of outstanding uh, public uh, institutions. So while these are some of the broader issues, these uh, issues also convey a story to all of us in terms of how uh, higher education in the current century uh, has become a vast uh, uh, enterprise and one of the uh, central uh, societal uh, resource as well, you know. And as I just mentioned a brief while ago, uh, this uh, particular situation also means that there are greater number of aspirants and uh, likewise uh, in uh, directly proportional terms, we also need uh, good institutions offering uh, good and quality uh, education. So it's just like a demand versus uh, a supply uh, scenario. Be that as it may, when we talk about this demand and uh, supply scenario, and when we talk about uh, the massification of uh, education, quote unquote, as even mentioned in uh, one of the UNESCO uh, reports, uh, but the developments that occurred in our country uh, till now are thus far not very uh, sort of uh, satisfactory uh, when we talk about bridging the gap between uh, private higher educational institutions and uh, public uh, higher educational institutions, uh, because there are far too many barriers uh, that one can uh, highlight and even point out, uh, which could either include, you know, uh, one of the aspects is the trust deficit aspect when it comes to uh, private uh, educational institutions, or even uh, the much needed aspect of uh, uh, decision making and even the uh, robust and uh, swift decision making with a transparency uh, that is needed uh, when uh, regulatory bodies and even higher educational bodies are uh, evaluating and collaborating with uh, public and private uh, uh, higher educational institutions. And there are so many bottlenecks that are there uh, given the uh, uh, constraints and the challenges. So this means that we all do have a responsibility to focus on these bottlenecks and even to uh, think about these bottlenecks and to sort of strategize as to what institutions can do and individuals can do and the civil society can do uh, that can feed into the policy spaces that are currently active be it in terms of the national education policy or even some other uh, far greater uh, public policy initiatives taken up by uh, the Ministry of Education, the University Grants Commission, and uh, various other uh, bodies of the uh, government of India uh, across uh, sectors, because uh, we do have a situation of uh, multiplicity of uh, uh, regulatory bodies to that extent. So therefore, the purpose of this particular session is to make uh, a sincere attempt to reimagine the future of higher education under the NEP 2020 in order to understand what are the debates and then in order to find out uh, what could be uh, the uh, way forward uh, to uh, sort of uh, evaluate and uh, assess some meaningful solutions uh, in order to ensure uh, the overall quality enhancement. So that's the purpose of this session and I'm so glad uh, to share with you all that uh, this afternoon to discuss this uh, important matters with us. Uh, we are joined by uh, Professor uh, YSR Murthy, uh, who is the uh, Vice Chancellor of uh, RV University, uh, Bangalore. And uh, Professor Murthy, before uh, moving on to become the Vice Chancellor of RV University, Bangalore, uh, he was the Registrar of the OP Jinder Global University. And uh, I really feel it my honor and pleasure uh, to be here in his presence this afternoon. And I welcome you, Professor Murthy, for accepting our invitation and joining us uh, at this very important meeting. We are also joined by uh, Mr. Samuel uh, Suresh, uh, who is the member 
uh, Board of Management, Vinayaka Missions uh, Research Foundation, uh, and which has been in the education sector for a little over more than two decades or even three decades, uh, contributing to varieties of disciplines uh, in the higher education spaces. And uh, we are happy that uh, Mr. Suresh Samuel uh, is here with us uh, to share his experiences and uh, perspectives. Uh, we are also joined by uh, Professor uh, S.P. Singh, uh, who is the Vice Chancellor of uh, Royal Global University, uh, which is located in uh, Assam. And it's a multidisciplinary uh, university, uh, which is doing some good work. And I'm sure that we will have an afternoon uh, with uh, enriching and engaging perspectives coming from you, uh, Professor Singh, to contribute to these timely discussions. Uh, we also have with us uh, Dr. Rajan Velukar, who is Vice Chancellor of the Atlas uh, Skill Tech University, based out of Mumbai. And we also have with us Professor Supriya Patnaik, Vice Chancellor of uh, the Centurion University of Technology and Management, uh, which is located in uh, different uh, places in uh, Orissa and Andhra Pradesh, but I think the main campus is in uh, Bhuvneshwar, and the discussions can only become more interesting uh, with the participation of uh, both uh, Dr. Rajan Velukar and uh, Professor Supriya Patnaik, uh, because they have a particular focus on engineering, technology, and skill-based education, which is uh, a very contemporaneous aspect, which is under discussion, and the government is also planning to set up uh, many more uh, skilled universities. Uh, in Delhi, already there's a university and even other state governments are also planning to set up few universities. So I'm sure that we can have an engaging conversation uh, this evening, drawing from your uh, experiences. So uh, what uh, I propose to do uh, within the uh, time that we have uh, this afternoon is that uh, moving forward, I will uh, raise few questions uh, asking you to respond. And then uh, thereupon, uh, we will also have questions from the uh, audiences who would join us uh, virtually. And then we will uh, close the uh, discussion. But before I get into any uh, specifics of the uh, 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 session this uh, afternoon, uh, I would like to seek a response from each one of the distinguished panelists present here like in the background of what all we had discussed, uh, there is a, a, a sad fact that we should agree that private higher educational institutions are looked at pejoratively in our country. The situation might be changing gradually, but a larger change is yet to happen because of the duality that we have and the duality of public versus private. And that's what we are discussing uh, this afternoon. So notwithstanding the ongoing developments, how each one of you uh, would like to address these challenges in a broader manner that people look up to private educational institutions as well, and they consider it to be an inspirational experience receiving education from private universities, something similar to public universities. I will start with uh, Professor Muthi, and then we can go to other panelists. Uh, thank you, Professor Sridhar. I wish to, um, at the outset, uh, compliment Professor Rajkumar, Vice Chancellor, JGU, and his entire team for uh, organizing this uh, excellent uh, summit. And um, greetings to all the distinguished uh, fellow panelists. The national education policy uh, spoke about the laudable goal of India becoming a Vishwa Guru. And uh, if you look at the current situation, um, India is nowhere uh, near that uh, goal of uh, Vishwa Guru. And uh, for many centuries back, um, India attracted um, some foreign students. But if you look at the current numbers, uh, and if you look at the All India Survey of Higher Education data, we attract hardly uh, less than 50,000 students. And uh, during the COVID pandemic, the number has in fact gone down. And we have, of course, a potential. And um, so in our country uh, needs to get its act together and accord priority to the higher education. And all of us also 
uh, in the field of higher education uh, must get our act together and um, take a number of steps and um, including uh, the breaking down of this uh, public private distinction in the higher education back to you professor freda thank you so much uh, professor muthi for those thoughts uh, now i will request uh, the other panelists starting with mr uh, suresh uh, samuel uh, to respond uh, to the question that i had just raised how to sort of bridge the gap between public and private so that private education institutions are not looked at uh, pejoratively and the steps that you have taken at your institution in order to ensure this yeah thanks professor sridhar and uh, congratulate uh, to jju university for setting up the summit uh, to the entire team i think it's a great initiative with regard to the g20 uh, what we are going through at this point of time uh, wherein uh, the messages from this summit uh, will go beyond india and also to the international forum when we are embarking on this nep 2020 Vinaya Missions uh, Research Foundation is primarily a health sciences university, and uh, we predominantly uh, provide programs across the entire spectrum of health sciences spaces. But we are also a multi-disciplinary university, wherein uh, we have other faculties ranging from arts and science, engineering to law, and also to uh, the uh, other physiotherapy and allied health sciences program as well. so when between india when we look at it i think between this private and public uh, uh, higher education system india has almost close to 1000 plus universities and 42000 colleges and predominantly if you look in terms of this i think there is a report which says that 47% of the university is public whereas 53% of the university is private and when it comes in terms of colleges only 22% represent with regard to public colleges whereas private higher education institution is close to 78% given this way that private in universities and institutions have grown in this country in the more than in the last two decades i think it's imperative that we really see how our reforms and regulatory reforms and the framework supports in terms of further fueling our private institutions and private in universities on the specific challenges which we face with regard to the collaboration uh, and with regard to the access to technology with regard to research and also with regard to exchange i would like to put it in this four spaces collaboration primarily with regard to i mean though private universities collaborate predominantly with the foreign universities the collaboration within our own nation with indian institutions of uh, higher education is very limited and next is goes in terms of the funding the government provides funding more on research to public universities whereas in private it is mostly self funded and there is a very limited scope in terms of how we would be in a position to really i am in progress more with regard to research and likewise with regard to the technology space though the digital infrastructure is going well still given the gamut of our population and we being the most populous country in the world where in more than half a billion of our i mean uh, youths would be uh, in 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 terms of uh, in the higher education space i think this technology infrastructure should also be further enabled and supported which would ease out this things between the uh, public and private the fourth point is with regard to the exchange the faculty exchange or a student exchange i think we should also encourage between the higher education institutions between the public and the private i think that is also going to enable us in terms of some very specific uh, collaborativeness which will help holistically in terms of development of higher education in our country let me stop here and would like to invoke other participants to also let know their views thank you uh, so much mr samuel now i will go over to uh, professor singh and thereafter dr velukar and uh, professor supriya patnaik to respond to this question and then thank you yeah thank you so much professor shridhar and my fellow panelists and first of all let me congratulate op jindal university for organizing such a wonderful world university summit and i think it is five days event and we are probably one day short of five days this is the fourth or third day today and i was part of some of the sessions so i have learned a lot from it and 
I think uh, for today's uh, session, if you talk about breaking the barriers of public and private universities in, in India, I would uh, start with my experiences and a little bit of uh, my uh, association with private uh, ecosystem of last 22 years. So it was a very young age. I became the vice, uh, vice chairman of a group of institutions in Lucknow in 2000. Then I decided before I decided to leave my government job. So my fellow panelists, I was just reading about all of you. Some of you are civil servants. Some are from the industry. Some are from the social sector. Uh, Madam uh, Pat, uh, Supriya, and maybe some of you are from other, uh, you know, government areas. My journey throughout is only academics, so I may be having less exposure than maybe some of you. But in the private sector, I personally believe because I've seen ups and downs. So I will share. First of all, I'll share the positive part of, as I think just now Professor Samuel has shared that how many public uh, institutions and private institutions are there. Mostly now the higher education landscape is being covered by uh, public, private institutions. So in the institutions have grown many fold in the last 22 years or maybe last 40 years, I would say that. And as a part of my journey, once upon a time when I was part of the uh, private university ecosystem, private college system, I used to think I'm very fortunate. There were two reasons for that. One was that number of institutions were very less and the demand was very high because of two reasons. One, I will try uh, straightforward say that on the population explosion of this country. And second, very important aspect because of that, the private institutions have grown in this country, may not be because of regulatory framework, may not be because of anything else. But second was a very aspirational parents. We have very aspirational parents that everybody wants their children to be highly educated and they want whatever it is, whatever savings they have, they will invest in their education. So these are the two aspects from 2001 to 2007 or eight was a fantastic time. And there was another issue important when I was feeling less gap between public and private, though it was a lot of regulation, though it was a lot of inspector Raj, but at the same time, there was a lot of demand. And another aspect that happened once upon a time, especially in Uttar Pradesh and few states, including Karnataka, if I recall, there was a huge funding of coming from the government to support a different class of the student to study even in private sector institutions with scholarships. So we used to get a very good quality student who were part and parcel of the scholarship schemes of different governments. And we were fortunate to get good intake in terms of the students. So that was a fantastic time. The students which are, who have come out during that period of time, I tell you honestly, they were not less than in the quality of education in most of the institutions, which were new institutions, which were not new institutions, was very, very good. But later on, when the explosion further happened and we started having massification, as been rightly said, I would say that in totality, uh, the quality has maybe gone down because of many factors. And that is where I say, I will just three, four reasons I will, uh, I will try to emphasize because you know, unless and until we have that kind of ecosystem, neither foreign universities will come to India. If they will come, they will fail. The private institutions, many of them are failing. They have failed. And many of us have to keep on investing to compete with the public sector uh, universities uh, because the finances are limited. And if you want to escalate to the next level of quality, I think that much of finance is required, which probably OP Jindal has got from the promoters, but not everybody will get. So in that context, I would like to say that unless and until there is a change in the funding mechanism of the education in India, that I always emphasize. I wrote one of the articles in the recent university news. I request my panel members to read that. I have requested from last four or five years that in place of funding the public universities and giving subsidized education, let us have a model which is based upon, I'm not talking, I'm, I'm leaving aside the outliers. Outliers being the remote areas, village areas where probably still some kind of funding in the public universities are required, public institutions are required. For others, it should be level playing field that a student should be funded. If at all, he do not have money to study, he should or she should get enough scholarship from the government of India to choose where they want to study. And based upon that, if they choose where they want to study, certain amount of money has been given, they will choose the institution of their liking and they will choose based upon the quality of the institution. And the institution will also try hard to produce quality education. And this way ecosystem will improve and the quality students will come to the private institutions. Most of us get the second level students. I'm not talking about the 
the two, three, four, or maybe ten colleges or the universities in the country which get the best. Even they get the student who who discard IITs or NITs and go to those institutions. But most of us we get the student when they don't get into those institutions. Not only based upon education system there, but mostly based upon the fee structure there. And therefore, my humble advice, and I request each and just think about this issue. If that level play field will be created by scholarship methodology, I think we private institution will become Harvard, Stanford, or any institution in the world we can imagine in due course of time, obviously. But otherwise, it will not be possible. So this is my take on the first go, and I'll be able to answer other questions when raised. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Singh, for those remarks. I will now uh, invite uh, uh, Professor Supriya Patnaik to uh, respond uh, to these issues. So uh, thank you so much, first of all, for uh, inviting me to this forum. I'd first of all like to congratulate OP Jindal Global University for organizing such a summit. And uh, I think it's very appropriate and timely. Um, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, we all agree that probably NEP is, uh, at this point of time, is very progressive. Uh, and it's... Uh, uh, really set out the agenda for uh, educational institutions. Uh, uh, having said that, uh, I would like to point out that whether you look at the sustainable development goals or you look at the NEP, one of the central focus is inclusive education. Uh, and I think uh, uh, when you look at, uh, and I like the way uh, Professor Singh talked about the level playing field, because we all know that the level playing field does not exist. But what I would like to highlight is that uh, when you, uh, especially in terms of the kind of university I uh, head, and this is the Central University of Technology and Management, Orissa, and we function uh, basically uh, from very difficult geographies. So uh, uh, I think uh, the whole idea is to enable affordable and inclusive education by doing that. Uh, uh, the especially when it comes to the support from uh, government, whether it's in terms of scholarships, fees, whatever it is, uh, the level playing field makes it, it gets even further enhanced when we are talking about these difficult geographies. So I'd just like to highlight this point that uh, uh, you know it's all it's quite okay if you're working if you're uh, operating out of a tier one or a tier two city, but when you start going further in interior, then it becomes that much more difficult. Uh, so this is one point I would like to raise. The other point, again, which was touched upon by all the panelists is about the uh, regulations uh, which are uh, there. And we are a skills university. We actually work at integrating skills into higher education. And uh, uh, so, uh, I, I, I uh, you know, the whole idea that now the policy framework within the country is talking about the academic bank of credits. Uh, and uh, so I think that uh, itself sounds very good, but I think the proof of the pudding is in its eating. So how it pans out, if somebody comes from a, a remote university, can they move into one of the uh, uh, best institutions, let's put it that way. So that those are, the, or can they pursue some courses there even? Uh, and I think that brings up uh, another issue. So these uh, uh, two issues I would like to point at this stage uh, uh, and I'll come back to it as the questions arise. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Supriya Patnaik. Now I will request uh, Dr. Rajan Velukar to share his thoughts with us. Dr. Rajan? Yeah. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Sridhar Patnaik, uh, for giving me and my university a, an opportunity to be in the panel. Uh, and I must compliment uh, uh, the uh, Jindal uh, University uh, for organizing uh, this program at this scale. And you are doing a wonderful job. Uh, Say my views on uh, this is, see, there are some advantages and there are some disadvantages to both the universities. As uh, I have worked in uh, 
uh, almost all kinds of universities, uh, open university, the public university of 163 years old, as well as uh, a university presently I'm working with, which is just a two years old uh, university. And therefore, when I look at uh, the uh, look at the situation in all these kind of institutions and universities, uh, I must tell you and I must appreciate that because of the private interventions in this country, I'm not talking about five years or 10 years or 20 years. I'm also talking about before independence. If there would not have been the private intervention into the education, many would not have got education in their life. And in the state of Maharashtra, I must tell you, before 1972, the government was not giving a salary grant to the colleges which were affiliated to the university because we have different systems in our country and therefore we need to understand what is the system. We have different kind of universities, whether it is a central university, which is almost a unitary university. The private universities are also universities. They may go beyond their campus after five years. Then we have the state public universities and then the state private universities. And uh, therefore, unless and until we understand this diversity in our country, we will not be able to uh, really um, uh, find the solutions to the uh, problems and to the barriers and challenges, whatever we have. And therefore, we need to understand and we need to appreciate the intervention of private sector in education. I must tell you, I was the person who opposed the private engineering colleges in the state of Maharashtra when I was young, when I was studying in the college. Because the state government took a decision that you will have to pay more than 10 times fees which you are paying to the public institution. Okay. But when I look at it, and when I looked at it after 10 years, when I became a teacher and then served, for, uh, served as a teacher in educational institutions, then I realized that when that IT sector came into existence, all these engineering colleges students got the job and then they we, we became uh, number one or number two in IT sector in the entire world. And therefore, I cannot forget that contribution of the private sector. Of course, there are barriers, there are challenges which we need to face. But I must say that people need to understand the expenditure on education per child. I was a member of one committee of fee fixation on public institution in 2001 in the state of Maharashtra, where the fees for a BCom course or a BSc course in public institution was only 1,000 rupees. And then we said, let us calculate the expenditure. When we calculated the expenditure, the expenditure in 2001 was around 12,000 rupees for commerce and around 14,000 rupees for uh, science. From where this money is coming? This money is coming from the public participation. Okay. And therefore, those who are studying in the public institution need to understand their fees is not 1,000. Their expenditure is 12,000 but their 11,000 rupees is paid by public. Whereas a child studying in the private institution is not getting that advantage. Whereas everybody is paying the taxes and out of those taxes, some taxes are going for education. Whereas a student studying in the private university is not getting that advantage. And therefore the biggest barrier to the private university, one of the barriers is now, slowly they are opening up, but when the private universities or private colleges were applying for the research grants from the government, the government were saying that you are a private and therefore why do you need that? But this money which is distributed for the research projects is from the public funding. And why, why you should deny the fund which you have received from public 
to a child who's studying in the private university slowly it is changing but we need to pursue this matter and the governments whether it is a state government or the central government should take a view that the child is not private the child is the responsibility of the state the federal government and therefore they should look at this from a very very different angle and the moment you look at it from a different angle then the people those who are paying more fees in the private universities may reduce so what are we doing we are reducing the burden on the child this is just one example which i am giving but other barriers to both the universities degree may differ so what are the barriers number one is contextual resistance i am leaving the 2% best of the best universities which are operating in the private sector i am leaving them because they are exceptional i have worked in a private university in a rural area where the population was 10000 so i am talking from that perspective so the first thing is the contextual resistance is the biggest barrier the second is lack of managerial experience nobody in higher education is trained for administration and therefore we need to demand that like ias and ifs there should be indian education services the moment you have indian education services that professionalism can come to this the third is i just finish in 30 seconds lack of understanding about the concept of social entrepreneurship we have never learned we have we are teachers we have never learned that entrepreneurship but now in 21st century we need to look at this education from the entrepreneurship point of view so that we can achieve the agenda of the nation of course uh, the day before yesterday uh, five days back i have said in the vice chancellor conference that the government of india as other developed countries uh, has the research agenda we have not created that professionally the research agenda of this nation and we are not pushing to the universities then the fourth thing is aversion to risk in public institution mainly they 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 will say ki no 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 i am going to retire and therefore i don't want to take this not taking risk even if they have money if they don't have money it's a different story but if they have money they are not taking the risk because they want to retire safely next is lack of technical knowledge about product processes these children are the product of future who are going to transform the nation so how do we look at that product professionally from the business angle i am not talking the business profitability angle but it is you have to look at it from this angle next is lack of knowledge about financing instruments very very uh, uh we are sorry we have not really understood and we don't have that kind of autonomy also but in the private sector some of the uh, owners they understand how to multiply and how to put that money into back to education then lack of qualified and motivated staff and volunteers this is what the problem which we are facing in higher education difficult to get motivated teaching staff beyond 20% that motivated staff we are not getting however we are tweaking in atlas skill tech university we are putting our own money to bring people from the practitioners industry not 10% that professor of practice i only had written to ugc to bring that concept and then the regulation has been made but we are putting our own money to bring many more people more than 10% 50% to our university to give that is a barrier to many private universities because they may not have money how do we bring of course to public institution also because they have the uh, governance issue and they have all regulations from government and other thing this is what uh, i would like to put it okay. Uh, uh thank you so much uh, dr uh, rajan velukar uh, for those very insightful pointer all the distinguished panelists uh, in fact uh, you know uh, the entire purpose of this session as is obvious we are discussing about the barriers and each one of you 
uh, have thoughtfully and provocatively uh, identified each of the issues which could even be pigeonholed uh, with the uh, any fundamental pointers uh, which uh, higher education institutions uh, will have to achieve, uh, be it in terms of either regulatory reforms or even multidisciplinary education or even the focus on faculty and even most important, uh, the governance and administrative leadership mechanisms. And of course, uh, the central issue, uh, which always uh, remains the key, and that is the uh, funding aspect. Uh, taking cue from this, while it is so heartening uh, to hear your views, uh, Dr. Velukar, and even uh, that particular aspect of uh, having an education service, uh, I'll come back to it a little later, but nonetheless, at the OP Jindal Global University, we started off with a modest initiative called the University Administrative Services, wherein we recruit uh, young graduates from our university after a rigorous and a competitive process to join these services. And then they would be on a leadership track working in different domains and departments of the university uh, so that they go on to get trained on the job and even develop an insightful sort of uh, skill sets to contribute to higher education governance. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, what I would like to now uh, go back and to ask all of you uh, uh, taking cue from these conversations is that governance is so very important and we talk about governance, we cannot but even ignore uh, the uh, regulatory apparatus we have in this uh, country, which is so dense and uh, we do have numerous uh, higher educational uh, regulatory bodies. So therefore, I would like to know from uh, Professor uh, Murthy and uh, Mr. Uh, Suresh Samuel and Professor S.P. Singh, uh, considering that uh, the institutions that you represent uh, have different disciplines and different faculties. So therefore, uh, how uh, your respective higher educational institutions are coping up with the issue of uh, fragmented higher educational regulatory bodies and what are the uh, strategies or the approaches that you have designed uh, to overcome these uh, issues? I will first uh, go over to Mr. Samuel and then Professor Murthy and Professor Singh. Uh, so Professor Sridhar, let me confine to the health sciences related regulatory frameworks, what uh, we have starting from medicine to dentistry, to physiotherapy, to nursing, to allied health sciences, and also with regard to speech and language therapy. We go through a lot of stringent siloed uh, regulate, regulations. So this really inhibits specific focus with regard to research. Now, what is happening is we are constrained when it comes with regard to the medical institutions and uh, particularly on the health sciences space. The scope for doing a research is phenomenal. And we have been enabled with a good amount of technology backup also as a country, wherein the focus with regard to multidisciplinary is happening. However, since we don't have a level playing field, the contributions which can happen as a funding with regard to the research on the multidisciplinary space and specifically with regard to the health sciences space is very less. And again, on the research space, if you look into, again, they are governed by different bodies. No incentivize, no incentives or no SOPs are there with regard to any of these private universities or private institutions, which can really help in terms of argumenting more on the research footprint, which would really put our health sciences uh, related, uh, I mean, academic program in a better positioning. Now, second is again, with regard to the governance part of it, apart from the regulatory governance, what we have, we have been stipulated by much more stringent uh, academic governance and operating governance, wherein we, our ability to have a better uh, flexibility in line to some of this new education policy, uh, be it with regard to uh, the equity and inclusion, or be it with regard to faculty development, holistic development per se, and trying to bring some student centricity with regard to 
making the students get into uh, medical students to do some cross registration for some of the programs and how they can develop as a much more a holistic individual, like how you see things with Western countries. All these things are pretty constrained with our current regulatory framework. So health sciences, I think when I compare health sciences regulatory framework compared to technology and sciences or compared to law and other spaces, health science is very much constrained. And this is something that the new education policy and probably with the, the higher education commission coming up should really bring in some better flexibility in this uh, health sciences regulatory framework space, which would help in terms of holistic development of faculty, student, and also on the research front. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Samuel. Uh, Professor Murthy, your thoughts on this matter, please. Uh, yes, uh, I may not be able to give you the strategies being adopted by uh, our own university to cope with uh, some of these regulatory challenges, but I can flag the uh, issues uh, in general affecting everybody and what the uh, major policy uh, changes that can be uh, considered. Um, if you look at the uh, our policy domain, um, I had been in Government of India for about 24 years and later on worked in the private sector and I was also associated with the voluntary sector. Somehow our uh, policy makers um, were not able to see beyond the um, what you call central universities or state public universities. Uh, Professor Singh talked about level playing field, but um, though uh, uh, Professor Samuel mentioned about how nearly two thirds of uh, uh, educate, I mean, institutions in higher education were handled by the private sector, uh, yet you know uh, the government uh, did not really create a, a proper um, ecosystem for the private sector to flourish. Uh, for instance, um, today there is a laudable goal of doubling gross enrollment ratio, but it requires a, a, a proper ecosystem. For example, if some well-meaning individual wants to contribute to the society and wants to come forward and establish, let's say, a university or a college, uh, can you imagine the kind of difficulty he or she has to go, go through? For instance, uh, um, there is a... Uh, uh, um, regulatory approvals, government approvals, environment approvals, and uh, it's not easy. And uh, there are obstacles at every stage. Um, leave aside a person wanting to establish a new institution. You take, for instance, an existing institution, want to, let's say, uh, start a new school or start a new program or increase a sanctioned uh, intake in a uh, already approved program. Uh, for many uh, state uh, private universities, they need to approach their uh, state government for approvals and uh, also go through the um, inspections and uh, wait for even after inspections, uh, the approval may not come easily. So there are uh, what happened all these, uh, um, in fact, you mentioned about uh, the trust deficit um, and uh, our policies somehow were made keeping a few black sheep, uh, particularly the fly-by-night operators or uh, um, those degree granting mills in view. And in that process, try to punish uh, even the uh, some excellent and uh, good institutions in the private sector, uh, which are trying to uh, promote the social uh, uh, well-being or a common public good. And so that's why very, there's no one size fits all policy. So we need to be really uh, what you call uh, create a proper ecosystem uh, and create a level playing field for the private sector to uh, flourish. And they, we also uh, need to give um, uh, autonomy and freedom uh, for them to operate and then abolish all this inspector inspection raj. And that's uh, uh, one suggestion uh, from my end. And uh, corruption-free governance is also another major step I would suggest. So these are, um, uh, if you want to double grass enrollment ratio, if you want to become a Vishwa Guru, we need to fix the policy, we need to um, unleash the creative energies of individuals in the private sector, and also we uh, need to create a proper ecosystem. Thank you so much, Professor Muthi, for those uh, very thoughtful remarks. 
uh, I would now like to draw the attention of uh, Professor S. P. Singh uh, to reflect upon this very important matter. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. I think uh, I'll start with uh, some positive uh, outcome of the regulatory system because you know we are talking a lot about what uh, I will definitely talk about those issues. But being associated with private uh, ecosystem from last almost as I said twenty two years. And uh, knowing the fact that many entrepreneurs who have established private institutions and the universities may have not the intention to provide quality education, but may or many of them may be having other ulterior objectives. So somehow or other, I would say that uh, almost 564 colleges were under UP Technical University. When I was their executive council member and Professor Damodra Chare was the chairman of AICT, since then I'm talking about the regulatory mechanism was fine. Inspector Raj was too much, but I would say that today, whatever is there or whatever little bit these institutions are having as an infrastructure, as a faculty or as a requirement, as per the as, as a requirement of the higher education, almost 80% of them are having only because of the regulatory mechanism. This is one side of it. Second side is I'm always happy to discuss and believe there's something called graded autonomy that uh, NEP also talked about. The best of the institution, which are part and parcel of that regulatory mechanism and are being graded by them, whatever the A or A plus grade and also been given approval from last 15, 10, 20 years and found good, they should be beyond that regulatory mechanism because they have built up a brand and it is believed that they will continue to provide quality education. So therefore, as somebody has rightly said, not all things fit in one particular casket. You have to have different models. But I have still, uh, though uh, when Professor uh, Samuel was talking about, about the medical education, I am maybe fortunate or unfortunate that I have almost everything in my university except medical. And we have Pharmacy Council of India, we have Nursing Council of India, State Nursing Council, AICT, Bar Council of India, Rehabilitation Council of India. So we have a full ecosystem, we have a full department to look into the issues of regulatory framework. And there is a Assistant Deputy Registrar Regulatory Compliance. Can you imagine how much pain one university take to keep take care of this regulatory mechanism and every day we are consciously watching each and every website and trying to find out when the inspection is going to happen and what is going to happen we are always having a sword on our head so that is another point of view which everybody should understand at the same time when i talk about a fragmented higher education i do not limit myself because already a lot of thing has been said about a regulatory mechanism i said it is graded it should be graded and it should be under one umbrella or a maximum two umbrella that NEP has envisioned and I think that will happen. But the second point about the fragmentation is what probably we are suffering at the same time when we have so many educational institutions, we are also being questioned about the quality of education and also we are also being questioned about employability. So their fragmentation of the other kind, which is fragmentation between institution, institution collaboration, industry institute collaboration, and the requirement of the outcomes based education, which is required for the skill or for that matter, any kind of education. So we industry talks that institutions are providing unemployable youth, but industry do not come forward to be part and parcel of the education ecosystem. I'm talking by and large, I'm not talking about 2% of the universities. I think most of us are representing that 2% or 3% of the universities, but in ecosystem, from village level to grassroots level to the top, we do not have enough inclusion of industry into education system. The research center which this institution established, industry established in their own campuses should be uh, in the education system so that research and collaboration go hand in hand and public goods are genuinely being created. That is another fragmentation. And third is about collaboration among Indian and foreign universities, lot many people have MIU, uh, MOUs. I was part and parcel of many universities earlier where the number of MOUs used to be used as a branding perspective, not actual effective MOUs. Those MOUs with the firm, but how many Indian institutions are having MOUs among themselves? How they are supporting each other? Like IMs, when IM Jammu started, 
I am Lucknow was hand holding. I am uh, Jammu. Is there any institution in my area who tried to hand hold me when I was trying to walk? So what these institution of eminence, what these institution of high caliber, private and public are doing in isolation because the feedback or what the students and the teachers are coming from this lower strata from the institution which are in the surrounding area. Are we hand holding them to support the education system? So that is another fragmentation. So I've touched upon one is the fragmentation with respect to uh, uh, bodies which are regulatory in mechanism. Second is about industry fragmentation. And third is about collaborative fragmentation we have. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Singh. Uh, so this only uh, sort of uh, takes us to the uh, next point. While uh, we need a certain regulatory system, uh, although we cannot do away with the uh, system in totality, and even the NEP makes a, a, a particular reference to this, uh, wherein uh, it states that we need a light but a tight uh, uh, regulatory system. So uh, I would like to uh, hear from uh, each one of you as to uh, what would be your suggestions uh, to deal with these uh, issues of a fragmented regulatory system and then uh, to sort of focus on quote unquote, the light but uh, tight regulation as mentioned in the uh, NEP. A quick uh, sort of, you know, 30 seconds uh, thoughts from each one of you, then we can go on to the uh, next aspect of our uh, discussions. Thank you so much. I'll start with uh, Dr. Uh, Rajan. Uh, Rajan? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, 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 the sentence, the phrase, light but tight, is fine, but if we want to implement that, the most important thing is you need to have trust in all the educational institutions which has been established by the by the parliament or by the state legislation. And if you you have established them, you have trust and then give them autonomy. You just create a broad framework. Of course, with uh, uh, Higher Education Commission of India, all these regulatory bodies will become one. They will not. There are 19 councils in this country, 19 councils. And we are fighting for this since more than 15, 20 years to bring it under one umbrella. So now they have created a Higher Education Commission of India. I suppose if that Higher Education Commission of India was properly, the issue which we are facing about so many regulators will diminish, will vanish. The only thing is they will have to bring the law education uh, into it. They also should bring agriculture education and they also should bring medical education into their purview because we are talking about interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. So when they are talking about light but tight, they should have only one regulator in this country for higher education and not so many fathers. Only one father they should have. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Rajan. Uh, Madam uh, Supriya Patnaik, over to you, please. Thank you. Uh, this has uh, always been an interesting question for us because we are also a multidisciplinary university. And uh, as rightly has been pointed out, there's a lot of trust deficit. The problem being that, uh, uh, you know, uh, whereas for the public universities, uh, it's a cakewalk when it comes to regulations. For the private universities, the demand is for greater compliance. And I think as long as we have that kind of difference, uh, it's going to be a real big issue. Uh, needless to say, uh, we have also always been talking about having this single regulatory body. Uh, it, it, it is the way to go. We understand that. Uh, but I, I think it's uh, going to be extremely challenging. It's going to be extremely challenging to do that. And uh, uh, because also the kind of regulations, for example, uh, you know, when you have uh, 
uh, a maritime program with a DG shipping. Uh, that is an extremely stringent kind of a regulation. And uh, so those, uh, I, I think we'll have to wait and watch the space. It's creating that ecosystem and enabling and allowing the, giving the autonomy for universities to operate, whether it's public or private. Uh, but it's really uh, enabling that ecosystem to flourish. Thank you, Professor Supriya Patnaik. Uh, uh, over to you, uh, Mr. Samuel. Uh, so in my view, I think uh, we need to have an equitable private participation with this regulatory uh, structures and framework. Uh, in fact, uh, predominantly, if you see, though there are some small time, uh, I mean, uh, councils have been formed uh, for supporting the larger framework. I mean, when it comes in terms of the Apex framework, where there we see uh, uh, not equitable participation from the private universities. I think this is very important so that the joint regulatory framework where private also has a equitable participation would really help in terms of easing out a lot of things. Very imperative for India because we being the populous country in the world and we are going to supply the major workforce in future for the globally. I think it's imperative that, I mean, our government starts thinking in terms of inclusion of private players on an equitable basis with regard to such regulatory norms, which would really help in terms of positioning us better with regard to the expectations of the future. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Samuel. Uh, uh, Professor Muthi, uh, I would request your thoughts on this matter, please. Yeah, I'll put this issue in the context. If you look at the last seven decades of regulation, um, you it has hampered innovation, it has hampered entrepreneurship, it has hampered growth also. Today, we are struggling to double the GER. It's all on account of some regulatory uh, challenges. So in that backdrop, this light but tight looks good, sounds good, but uh, we need to uh, wait and watch for the uh, design of the this light and tight regulation. What does it uh, involve on paper? Uh, will it be detailed or will it be simple to administer or easy to administer? And uh, I want to add two other uh, aspects. We need to have a training and sensitization of the staff who are going to administer this light and tight regulation. Otherwise, it will be like a old wine in a new bottle. And there should be there's a need for a mindset change. Uh, among the people uh, manning the regulatory agencies. They need to perceive themselves as enablers and then facilitating the growth rather than uh, raising objections or uh, putting uh, roadblocks on the way. So, um, and then uh, there's of course a need to eliminate uh, corruption in the entire higher education sector. So these are my few thoughts. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Muthi. Uh, over to you, uh, Professor Singh. Uh, thank you so much. My take on this uh, light but tight is, I mean, light and tight, but tight can be tweaked. That is something I want to say because this is happening in the higher education ecosystem from quite some time. And one word in Hindi is called lakir ke fakir. That everybody who comes to do regulation, they are being bound by some set rules and they are so hard compartmentalized that even if the ecosystem do not allow him to comply that, we have to comply. For example, we require one is to two is to five ratio for professor, associate professor and assistant professor for most of the regulatory bodies, including if you apply for 12B of UGC or AICT. Do we have that, that many associate professors eligible, qualified in this country? Regulatory bodies should find it out and give it to us if they are, they are available to us. Are those many professors available in this country? But that is not. So that is something where the tight will not work. Light but tight will not work. There should be light but tight with some flexibility depending upon the situation or the country where it is growing very fast and ecosystem is changing, number one. Number two, the second point is while establishing three universities and some or four or five institutions, every time the regulatory system goes like this, you apply to the regulatory body for getting LOI, that is called letter of intent. 
And then based upon that LOI, some documentary evidence you have to prove, then you establish the institution. By the time you establish the institution, you are already down with 90% investment and almost all your credibility is involved in establishing that institution. And then come the regulation, then come the regulatory body to find out you are right or wrong. You're already been drowned by neck, only your nose is left. So that, that point of time, the tip gives you an uh, advantage or disadvantage that you are being exploited by corruption, corrupt practices. So the mechanism also need to change in the view that it should not be exploitative in nature. It should not be against the normal entrepreneurial skill of individuals who want to establish and they invest everything and then they beg to the regulatory bodies for getting the approvals. So this is another thing which I faced in the last 22 years. Whenever there is a regulatory body, we apply, we establish everything, and the day has come, doomsday has come, the regulatory body is coming and they will accept you or reject you. And, and I'm talking about the regime. Everybody knows what happened to AICT, what kind of corruption has been exposed there. I'm talking about not only a long year, it was only 10 years, 12 years back. So that kind of ecosystem, the systems and processes need to be changed in education ecosystem. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Rajan, uh, I see that you would like to say something about this matter. Yeah, no, I, I would like to add in a lighter way uh, that uh, uh, the word university came from the word universe. <laughs> and universe is always expanding. And if universe is always expanding and city is in the universe, we have to create a city in the universe then we should not use the words like tight. <laughs> so, that is what I just wanted to communicate. I said flexibility, yeah. Go openness. On. If you don't have the openness, there is no meaning. So it should not be tight. You should have trust on the educational institution. You go back 150 years before or before Britishers. Where, where were the regulations? But we, we, we know how best we did prior to the Britishers came to this country. And therefore, we should have trust on our own people. And then the customer, I, the, the customer who's coming to us, he, he, he knows what he wants. And therefore, he's choosing na, colleges. He's not going to Tom, Dick and Harry College or a university. But he wants admission in JGU. He wants admission in IIM, he wants in IIT. And therefore, they also have become choosers. They know what to learn and what not to learn and where to go and where not to go. And therefore, that tightness has killed. The tightness which has been brought by these uh, apex bodies has killed the education. Otherwise, we would have 10 years ahead than what we are today. Thank you, Dr. Rajan. Uh, Professor Muthi, uh, quickly. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Um, for example, um, there's one thought I wanted to share. There, access to research funding was mentioned by one of the panelists. Um, if you, I mean, recently I'll narrate one personal experience. One of our professors applied to ICSSR and got a funding for a major research project. Suddenly, he, she was told that uh, your university doesn't have a um, like a 12B approval and please get it or find a public institution which has a 12B and pair it with it and then come back to us. I think this is archaic and the 12B system was done many, many years ago. And uh, I know um, that inspection and getting 12B is also a very, what you call um, the tedious process. So if a research project is worth the funding and if it is uh, um, the founded um, by uh, ICSSR, that it is a, uh, it has a merit and then uh, all this, you know, we should give away this 12B processes and we should fund it actually. That should be why when you're talking about uh, breaking the distinctions between public and private and we should make the access to research funding open to everybody. Uh, the merit of the proposal or research project should alone be the consideration and not these. Uh, uh, and if you want research to flourish, if you want people to grow, universities to grow, some of these uh, things require relook and reimagination. Thank you so much, Professor Muthi. In, in, in terms of what each one of you had mentioned, 
only you know uh, takes us back to the point of uh, trust deficit and to sort of have a joint uh, uh, consultative machinery wherein uh, the uh, divide between uh, the public and uh, private is uh, properly uh, bridged and wherein the institutions are also empowered and the responsibilities are recognized. I think that's one of the uh, best ways forward uh, in order to ensure that uh, the spaces in the higher educational institutions work uh, actively and contribute to the goals of higher education. Uh, now, on this particular note, I must say, uh, we are unfortunately running out of time. I know that uh, this kind of a panel uh, requires a longer duration or even a commemorative conference uh, because India is growing, India is expanding and even the opportunities in and around the country and in the world, they're expanding. So there's only going to be uh, much more focus on higher education uh, with uh, private players coming into the picture. And there are so many issues, issues pertaining to uh, regulations, issues pertaining to governance, and even the entire concept of higher education uh, that will have to be uh, addressed and readdressed uh, to understand what are the kind of approaches and strategies uh, that societies and governments shall take up uh, because uh, towards the end, uh, it's also significant that there is a kind of a change in the uh, societal attitude as well towards uh, private higher educational institutions, at least those institutions within the country, uh, so that parents, students, and other beneficiaries, they trust these institutions fully and they send their wards for higher education over here. And I think... Uh, it is incumbent upon the higher educational institutions also uh, to work uh, towards these aspects. Uh, now, I'm going to stop here, uh, although, you know, we can have a longer uh, conversations in and around uh, these matters. Uh, but within the remaining five minutes time that we have, a uh, quick, quick thought from each one of you. We do have a couple of uh, questions uh, from the uh, spectators, and I'm going to relay one of the questions to each one of you. Uh, to have uh, your quick responses. Now, during the pandemic and post the pandemic, if I may use this particular phrase, uh, there's a lot of focus on uh, digital education and even the government has been focusing on this particular aspect. Uh, so one of the viewers would like to know uh, from you, uh, the panel members, uh, in terms of what's your take on the prohibition on certain programs to be offered uh, in the uh, online or the di uh, digital mode. Uh, I will start with you, Professor Supriya Patnaik, and then we will just go to Dr. Rajan Velukar, Professor Singh, Mr. Samuel, and Professor Murthy. Um, you see, actually, I, I think that the whole uh, digital aspect uh, opened up uh, really during the pandemic, although there were few players who were doing it prior to that. So it was a big opportunity and a big challenge as well. Uh, I think uh, uh, most institutions also took to it then and people keep claiming that we were the first starters, so on and so forth. But I think over a period of time, uh, the uh, you know uh, regulations very clearly state that you can, uh, if you're not going into overall uh, or open digital kind of uh, program, uh, uh, then you have to have at least 20% of your courses, uh, which is digital, uh, which you can use uh, the digital mode. And uh, we would prefer that because I mean, after all, at the end of the day, uh, your ability to take up that would either depend on your ranking or your qualifying in uh, putting in an application to provide digital uh, education. So uh, we uh, one has to uh, then look at uh, fulfilling all the requirements of the ranking. Uh, then you would uh, first of all become eligible to provide that. Or uh, on the other hand, you do it, uh, the route of application, which you may or may not get. So I think that uh, poses a certain limitation. Uh, again, I think it would depend on. Uh, the university uh, as to uh, how they would want to take this forward, whether they would really want to uh, participate in this space or not. Uh, and I think uh, 
as long as uh, you know you you may not have a choice in the future but you would still uh, i think you'll have to still work on that where you want to go thank you thank you so much uh, professor supriya patnaik uh, dr rajan velukar uh, your thoughts on this particular matter uh, regarding the prohibition of certain uh, programs in the online or the digital mode by yes. the upc thank you um, in fact why the questioner would want to restrict uh, only for certain uh, uh, programs gandhi ji talked about 3h head heart and hand whatever can happen with head that can be digitally offered there is no question even with to some extent the operations can be performed through robots from a distance but at the same time there has to be a some person at that particular place at a distance place so if something happens he or she has to do it these are extreme cases but whatever whatever knowledge has to be given which can be offered digitally which the head can acquire but hand how you will give the experience of the hand at many places you need that hand experience experience by hand and the heart as swami vivekananda said why do you go to a college you don't go to a college to go to the classroom and then learn whatever that is one thing but you are going to a college for an environment the peer learning you are learning from each other say so when the wix doesn't help you alone your mother's hand and wix helps you and therefore totally digital education is i am not for 3h we should have we should create an environment and then only we will be able to learn that is what my view is uh, thank you uh, dr rajan uh, uh, yes ma'am quickly let us briefly come back i think i li i'd like to just reiterate again what dr rajan was saying that when we are looking at skills education especially a very hands on experience based practice oriented and looking at industry interface then i think it is absolutely critical that you can't offer it digitally so there would be certain uh, number of things that you would have to uh, enable it to be done uh, in a hybrid mode you know at least thank you thank you so much uh, professor supriya patnaik uh, quickly uh, over to you uh, professor singh followed by mr samuel and professor yeah. my quick response is that uh, definitely head heart and hand is important but uh, seeing the ecosystem when we want to you know massify and also want to have gr going to 26 to 50% there will be compromise on the fronts so there will be we we accept it or not accept there will be some compromise what we having because of the proliferation of education all right but i have something which i have actually followed from quite some time starting from igno to distance education or maybe digital education or bringing some questions what you have raised about certain courses not to be offered on the digital mode concentrating on that i would say that i am okay for all unless and until there is a ecosystem been created around and the admissions have been done consciously if a person is doing agriculture in the field is hands on with the all equipments and doing agriculture in the field and is having his own land to do agriculture and he is a sincere i'm not talking about unethical people joining education ethical people joining education system class why can't it be delivered digitally to him one portion two portion or three portion of it and practical he is doing more than somebody who is studying in the institution like us and doing the practical aspect while going to a some farmland or going to some hospital to do that somebody who is working in the hospital administration may not be educated for that purpose if digitally he want to join hospital administration and he is genuinely working there full time i don't think so there is harm in giving that kind of education because hand is already involved heart definitely will take part and for that i think we have contact programs including distance education to digital 
there should be some contact program one to one and there probably heart can also be associated why i'm talking about this i'm not refuting anybody who has said about these issues but there is a compulsion there is a requirement in this country to have definitely in our institutions after corona pandemic time no teacher wants that their students to be taught by digital mode i am also in favor of it if you have that ecosystem where it is possible to have a one to one education is the best there's no alternate for that however we need to find out ways and means to have either digital or digital platforms through which we complement our students or to have a digital program i think anything can be produce, can be given except maybe maybe medical i don't know about that maybe if some kind of things can be originated and we have we are very problem is that in india if you offer something digitally all those who are not part of that digital system in the name of job they join that without having that backup where they can be trained while they are doing that digital education so this is something which somebody has to look after the regulation should decide that not everybody should join join those kind of courses only people who are working in those areas should be allowed to join such kind of institutions thank you so much uh, professor singh uh, over to you mr samuel yeah in my view i think uh, given the nep focus specifically with regard to student centricity where uh, the focus is going to be on a flexible curriculum and exit options where ability to have a hybrid mode irrespective of the program i think that is very much required and also like what professor singh said i think uh, our ambitious goal of making 50% uh, ger by 2035 Uh, is very important and to make it happen i think we need to enable with regard to this uh, digital power or digital literacy which would really help in terms of i mean meeting the goals uh, even in medical for that matter i think uh, i mean there are certain areas where we think we we need to have that uh, digital interface so today robotic surgery can happen from a remote perspective and i mean teaching robotic surgery digitally is something that uh, is more uh, uh, imminent at this point of time so likewise i think uh, there is no program where we can tell that it need to be no digital i think every program can have a component of digital and it need to be a hybrid model in terms of how the program is designed and i think like uh, we need to have an ecosystem where the checks and balances are there so that it it falls within the framework in terms of ensuring the skill competency and also the i mean the uh, overall knowledge that a student has to acquire with regard to this digital interface so that would be my point of view thank you so much mr samuel uh, professor muthi you will have the last word please Uh, i am in favor of the removal of the current regulations uh, which allow only a select institutions based on their nac score or nirf ranking to uh, give uh, offer courses in open distance learning mode or online mode uh, for several reasons one it works against the uh, nep's objective of doubling ger second right currently uh, ugc permits 40% of the course content to be offered through online courses but during the covid pandemic it was 100% online and putting restrictions based on the nac score which is again not so credible or nirf again doesn't offer a level playing field for example it treats public and private institutions in the same manner a public institution which gets hundreds of crores without making much sweating or without batting an eyelid and on the other hand a private self financing institutions both are ranked in the same uh, this thing so if we want to uh, uh, increase the ger we need to look at uh, flexible ways we need to uh, remove the existing regulations and in case uh, there are a few uh, what we call uh, uh, players who are not giving quality online content or odl content they can be handled uh, uh, through other uh, ways and uh, this is my take and uh, current thing which regulations which are so detailed which hamper the what we call uh, uh, private well meaning individuals coming forward should be removed lock stock and barrel thank you so much uh, professor muthi uh, in fact i am grateful to each one of you for having uh, taken out time to uh, join us at this session uh, unfortunately we ran out of time uh, but i know that uh, these are all uh, ongoing issues and at least uh, some of the 
uh, institutions in the uh, uh, private sphere can come together uh, to focus on uh, 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 good deliverables and uh, offering uh, quality education, because it's a fact indeed uh, that uh, we'll have to have both virtues alongside vices. And what is required is uh, kind of an auspicious confluence of false stakeholders uh, to look at the larger and the brighter picture of uh, higher education. And uh, perhaps that's the way forward uh, based on the conversations that we had uh, this uh, afternoon. And I'm grateful to each one of you uh, once again uh, for having taken out time to uh, join us at this very important uh, forum. And uh, let us work uh, collectively uh, towards uh, you know, envisioning and having a much more uh, accountable and uh, light, quote unquote, uh, regulatory systems. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Professor Patnaik. Thanks, everyone. And, Thank you. And Thank uh, you. we enjoyed. Thank, Thank you. And uh, working in isolation will not help anybody. And therefore, private and public should come together. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It, is, it should be private and public and no more private versus public. <laughs> yes. We should come <laughs> yeah. together. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. It was nice Thank moderation. You. Thank you. So Thank you. Thank you.